Welcome to 2020 and the first episode of the Bees and Honey podcast. Today we'll be hearing from Xaviera Simmons, who's based in New York City. Uh, her work is just sublime. You have to look for it online. Uh, but listen to her right now and take in all the perspectives she has over years of working in the art world. Thanks for joining us again, and I hope you join us for the rest of this exciting year in art. What I love about Anchor is that it's given me creative control of my own material. I was approached by a big company to do a podcast about the art world, and I didn't want to sign over all rights to them. Uh, Anchor has allowed me to make this podcast and to keep creative control as well as financial control in terms of advertising. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free. You can use it on your phone or your computer. There are tools that help you to upload your recordings uh, that you've done separately or on the app. They'll distribute it for you as well, which again, you know, I couldn't wrap my mind around distribution and they have it all there for you in one place, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. Uh, You can easily make money from it as well. Uh, They help you advertise. As you can see right now, I'm getting my first ad out through Anchor. And all you have to do is download the app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Good luck with your podcast and getting your voice out there and owning your content. Hi, Xaviera. It's Nicolette. Hi, Nicolette. How are you? Oh, good, good. So uh, if you would like to introduce yourself, that would be great. I think we met in the early 2000s at Art Oh My Artist Residency, correct? Um, I believe so, although the early 2000s seemed like a really long time ago, but I believe so. Right. Um, well, you've been doing <laughs> this work I... for a long time. I think so. I'm starting to be, I'm, a mat- I'm becoming a mature artist, but um, I'm Zyveria Simmons and I'm a visual and performing artist. I try to make different types of work uh, happen simultaneously, I would say. And I am from New York. I am an American on all sides of my lineage until you get to like 400 years ago when this, you know, or plus when this country was founded. And um, I currently am a visiting lecturer and uh, at Harvard, uh, and I am really happy to be here. Well, tell us about Harvard, actually, because I don't know much about their creative, uh, their art program over there. Can you tell me a little bit about that, how that works? Sure, sure. Um, so I, um, you know, they, they're, they have a really rigorous, um, film department and Mm -hmm. they also have a visual arts and, uh, environmental studies program as well. And I think, you know, they're kind of really paying a lot more attention to the creative, um, fields, obviously, because, there's, you know, interest from students and I'm really happy to be there, especially this year, because I understand how critical that institution is as a, as a founding institution in this country. So Mm -hmm. obviously in this country, but you know, whose resources came from, um, Caribbean, uh, plantations. Um, right. So I'm, yeah. So I'm kind of always, pushing my students to be engaged both creatively and politically because you you know Harvard it's Harvard and Yale are very fundamental in our political atmosphere so I'm interested in my students understanding that the people that you know move our world are tied to this institution so while they're getting an education at Harvard in art, they're also going to get an education in the, in the political because it's a foundational space. Absolutely. You know, I really, uh, sometimes I'm uh, talking a lot of crap about how things run in America, but indeed we should be grateful to be able to have the ability to say something politically with our art. You know, I, I spoke a couple of times to a few Russians and, they don't touch that subject at all because uh, they don't want to be targeted. So 
it is a bit of a luxury and I'm grateful that we can address the things in politics and society with art. I, I agree with you. I mean, it is a luxury and I think it's a luxury that we as a collective group of citizens take for granted because, you know, this country, we have to advocate. We don't, I don't think we realize how much you have, have to actually advocate for what happens inside of this country in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I think we think it's kind of running on autopilot, but the United mm -hmm. States government has 80,000 offices, right? Mm -hmm. So it's helping to run how we live. Mm -hmm. And I think it's up to our citizenry to really understand that we have to kind of advocate in different mm -hmm. ways on a regular basis so that we can continue to have these freedoms because these freedoms, while they are here, mm -hmm. um, they're also, you know, under threat of being stripped away in different ways. And we also understand that we live in a very intense you know, there's a lot of guns here. So that, that freedom of speech mm -hmm. is tied to us advocating, uh, you know, for other things so that we can continue to have that freedom in different circles. Right. And I mean, you know, the idea of uh, funding from the government being continually uh, chipped away perhaps uh, points to the fact that uh, they don't really value art as a vehicle to promote uh any political cause that happens to be in office at the time, I guess. Um, you uh, mean in the United States? Like the NEA or whatever it's called. Yeah, in the U.S. Well, this year the N well this year in the U then the NEA has received, you know, more funding. But the, the 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 critical thing about the United States that I think that we tend to forget is that while we do have like a uh, working government and with mm -hmm. all of these offices, what we mm -hmm. don't have is secure social services. Mm -hmm. So you can exercise your freedom of speech here, but mm -hmm. it comes with the threat of being fired or, you know, a lawsuit or all these kinds of things. And then you have no social back, you know, you have no kind of, you don't have the best social welfare yes. system for a country of this size and of this, <laughs> Uh, economic stature and, yeah. yeah and economic stature so it's it's mm -hmm. you know it's complicated that freedom of speech because it it's it's to really exercise it you need to have more resources to feel comfortable that you might not receive resources if you do take a stand politically whether right. it be as an artist or as an educator or as a curator or writer correct yes well, what's your take, uh, talking about resources, what's your take on the current climate of the increasing monetary value of African-American art? I don't know if you've been riding that wave with a bunch of other artists, but uh, how do you feel about that uh, focus in the market right now? Um, I mean, I think obviously it's something, you know, that should be happening, but it, it's something that has to continue to be happening. Um, I, I think that, you know, African Americans, you know, which includes a lot of different types of cultures and people make up, you know, 14% of the population. And we mm -hmm. should have, we should have that same kind of equal resources comparatively plus then some if you go into the lineage and historically what has happened to us on especially on these soil on the soil over mm -hmm. generations like you know mm -hmm. it's it's just due i mean you know there's my generation then there's you know lorna and simpson and carrie may weems and mm -hmm. you know you go on and on norman lewis you go back you know i mean all of this mm -hmm people have been paving the way regardless of income. And now here we are where some of us are receiving, a lot of us are receiving the visual acclaim and some of us are receiving the financial uh, compensation. Benefit. I mean, it's, right. yeah, benefit. It's complicated because I think that people use blackness uh, as, mm -hmm. because blackness is the foundational quote unquote, cool. So they use right. blackness for all kinds of things that don't equal our stature in society. When you look at the statistics and data of how we live and how we actually as a group live and exist. But 
it's really important that we are compensated for our intellectual capabilities because we've been disenfranchised for so long historically in this country, especially that, you know, I mean, and, and the thing about black Americans in particular is that we are usually carrying more than just ourselves. Whereas white artists oftentimes have, you know, family resources, all kinds of inheritances. And, you know, Mm -hmm. that doesn't happen with us. We are like, it's, you know, the first time we're making this kind of a living. Um, Mm -hmm. To be able and and because of that, we're supporting whole families or we're supporting communities. I mean, it goes mm-hmm. deep. So it's the time. Mm-hmm. The time is now, and it's got to continue. And then we've got to advocate for other groups to also receive it. You know, their due. You know, mm-hmm. because it's part of the cultural conversation. It's this is this is a cultural exchange. It's how we create culture, and we need to be compensated for our intellectual rigor, which is right, which is the foundation of how this country moves. And uh, in terms of how would the climate now, uh, in terms of institutions, uh, be regarded, you think, from from your point of view, in terms of acceptance of and showing art by African-Americans and also by African-American women? I mean, it's the cool thing, but do you think it's going to last? I mean, I mean, there are... 40 million black American people here in this country of, like I said, of various different or 40 million families, I think Mm -hmm. of different, you know, strands. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, we're not monolithic. I mean, there's some of us who've been here for generations and some who, who have assimilated into the culture over time, whatever that is. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I don't, it's not going to go away because the population itself is not going to go away. So, you know, I think there's, this country is founded on an interest in the black body. It is, Mm -hmm. that is, it's, it's always been that way. The black body, the indigenous body, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's founded on it. And so I think that the fascination of it tied to like visual culture is probably gonna remain for a good while i mean yeah at you know it but at the same time collectors have to also become you know collectors and institutions we have to consistently stretch their imaginations through these these images and through these artworks that we make because if we keep you know kind of repeating the same types of tropes then mm-hmm. at some point, at some point, people will lose interest only because, you know, they understand the language. But we are so multifaceted and so diverse in our expressions that mm-hmm. we have to continue to stretch the language and they people will catch up. And also, as this boomer, baby boomer generation moves to a different phase of life. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that you have a generation X, quote unquote, generation X and another generation that has to be re-educated, unfortunately, and as to the importance and significance of, of, of collecting diverse, and I use that word meaning all types of people's, uh, mm-hmm. cultural, um, cultural output. So it's compli- mm-hmm. it's complicated because I think a lot about like a Silicon Valley, which has, you know, so much money, you know, Silicon Valley, Seattle, all these places that have so much money. Um, I don't know how these people with all these resources are being educated to understand the value of supporting culture, uh, and artistic production, you know, besides like as an investment. And that's, that's the only caveat. It can't be on their tastes only. It has to, it has to kind of, we have to continue to try to educate those people to understand all the value. Right. Well, I think we spoke a lot about what's happening outside. Now I'm going to pull back the lens and ask you a little bit about your practice. Can you describe your work, uh, how it's developed or what are you working on and maybe move backwards? Sure. So right now I'm working on, um, I actually just was working on a large, I've been working or being been invited to do a few large scale, uh, kind of more sculptural monumental works, um, and also public works, which are really exciting and engaging. And, um, some of them are, you know, kind of 
competitions. So that's been interesting because in that process, you get to learn about different communities and how they are, how, how to represent their vision. And then, um, so that's been exciting for me, but then I also consistently kind of push through different other projects like my photographic works. I've been mm -hmm. continuing a, a, a body of work called sundown, mm -hmm. which, uh, is tied to looking at, you know, the American landscape from its kind of inception through all of its different phases, especially as it relates to the material conditions of primarily, uh, you know, white people, descendants of, of chattel slavery and, you know, first nations people and, and branching out. So it's kind of a long conversation that I'm having with photography and with, um, history and research. And then, um, you know, yeah, I like that. I like that. I like those photographs. I, I like how you look at them and I like what they're saying, but I, I'm sorry, continue. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. No, no, no problem. Um, yeah, I mean, they're also tied to those photographs. They're really tied to also the way people look at images cont in a contemporary fashion and thinking about all of the cues that we have now, which are, you know, we're on onboarding, mm -hmm. you know, images at such a fast pace. So how do I kind of keep in the tide of that conversation? But, you know, mm -hmm. also I work very, um, I kind of, like I've said this before in other lectures, like I kind of feel like a sheep herder in that my studio goes in and out of different projects, meaning there's photographs and then there's text works and then there's performance-based works and then there's sculptural works and I'm really interested in films and animated works. And so how do I let all of the languages of those things kind of continue to speak to each other? So that's where I am right now is, is, is making sure that I give attention to the forms that I want to work through and mm -hmm. also continue to, to shepherd or like foster some, you know, some of the steady beats like my indexes, like my sundown series, like my text works. Um, and then, and, and then invite new forms in like animation, um, which has really been exciting for me because it's, um, it's so different from what I've traditionally done. And it's also so um, freeing because it's not the, it's not a traditional figure. It's, and you can have these figures uh, do things that it's hard to get human bodies to do like yeah. push rocks up a hill and then let mm -hmm. the rock fall on you. It's much more metaphorical. And I really um, appreciate that process. So that's something well, I've been really excited about. Well, tell us, you said it's different from what you worked on in the past. So tell us how you got to this point. Like, how did you start out and how did the work evolve to this point? So I started out as a photographer straight away. I mean, I've basically been, I would say, looking back, you know, over the past 40 years that I've been on the planet, um, I I would say that I've pretty much been an artist my whole life and I was never really discouraged to, you know, to not be an artist. I was always, I was always, um, encouraged to do that, which I want to do. And I've also been independent of, you know, the resources of my family for a really, like, since I was like 16 or 17. So I've mm -hmm. been on my own for a long time. I've worked to put myself through, you know, different colleges and graduate programs and all these things. And funny enough, I was a waitress for a while and also a photographer's assistant, fashion photographer's assistant. And I feel like those skills actually helped me to understand how to multitask, which is probably why I do the, the, the work that I do because I learned how to juggle many different types of, um, things so <coughs> that a situation could run smoothly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and then that led me to DJing and uh, which is how a lot of people knew me when I first started making artwork. And that led mm -hmm. me into, you know, but I was going to school at Bard mm -hmm. and that's what led me to studying photography and theater. And that's what led to, you know, understanding photography from an art historical lens, which it's not a long 
um, history. It's not yeah. a long history, you know, mm -hmm. photography. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's just spiraled out. I mean, as my interest in thinking about other artists and their influence and then social histories has spiraled out. So has my interest in using different materials and other mediums so that I could basically have conversations with different artists inside of my studio space. Uh, and, and that's kind of how it, it has worked. I'm very attached to, um, art history and social histories. And, 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 and I think that those two things are my anchors above all else. Yes, yes. You see that a lot in the work. So what is the next thing for you? Like, when are you showing next or with who are you showing next? Where are you showing next? Um, I have a show opening next month at, um, there's this, um, uh, with NYU, there's, they have a curatorial institute and I mm -hmm. am going to be showing at their, uh, the curatorial institute space, which is on the upper east side i believe at the it's the duke house so that's okay. coming up in february mm -hmm. um and then i'm doing a large-scale public work in miami at the african heritage cultural center art center in lincoln or uh, in liberty city so that's mm -hmm. coming up and then okay. i am producing new video works uh and an installation for an exhibition in norway and then i have um photographic works um showing kind of all over and uh i have a show up at sf moma right now a large scale painting and, wow that sounds cool uh yeah and of course i have to give a shout out to uh micheline thomas who uh curated me in her exhibition better days at the perez art museum no 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 mm -hmm. no at the so, let me just can we please cut that out <laughs> okay <laughs> i have to give it out a shout out to micheline who um has an exhibition up at the bass museum uh mm -hmm. and she curated me in that exhibition called better days and I, i'm sure i have a lot more other projects that i i those are the ones that are top of mind that i can talk about right now <laughs> okay that sounds all uh, extremely exciting and would you, uh, having been through all of this uh, the last few years and developing your own uh, voice through your work, your own uh, vision, what advice would you give to a young artist, especially a young African-American artist coming up uh, now in the world? I would, I, I mean, I would say my number one advice is give as much to the craft as you can. So when I say that, I mean financially, I mean, also really think about the move to New York, right? Or the move to a major metropolitan area, because what happens is people all want to be in these major cities at the sacrifice of their practice. And I think mm -hmm. that we're in a point, I think that we're at a point where you can actually live outside of New York or outside mm -hmm. of LA and mm -hmm. produce work and be in communication with artists that you love who are mm -hmm. like easily accessible via DM or whatever, and mm -hmm. also institutions. And I think that, you know, as a younger person, it's really important to push your studio practice beyond itself. Like, and that means that may mean staying, you know, wherever you are that you can financially afford without ha having to take on other jobs so that you can actually produce the artwork. You know, and then, yeah, and then, as you mature, you can you continue to uh start to come to these cities if you feel like you know I need to see the work, you know, I need to you know engage with people, but I think that it's a it's a slow process, and I also think please like Instagram, Facebook, all these things are fabulous for like a minute, but like the majority of your work should the majority of your time unless you are that type of artist should not be spent posting about your daily activities, but should be spent in the studio actually producing work and engaging with other artists in your community and forming, you know, conversations with them. And also young people learn the history. Like the, uh, this is not just coming out of a vacuum. This is a long lineage that we have to pay respect to, you know, 
are the people who've come before us and also the people who we're working side by side with. So I think it's, there's many different things, but the number one for me is to give to the work. You have to be willing to love that work as much as you love like a family member or like a pet or whatever. It's, it's, it's critical. It cannot be uh, neglected financially or emotionally. It needs to be tended to like, like any other living, breathing organism object organism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that is the best I've heard of advice for a young person in America or outside recently <laughs> i mean the uh, idea of uh being able to work outside and not come here and be like you said beat down by the economic necessities of living here it's 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 really freeing yeah <sighs> i tell it to my students all the time and no they don't believe me and i say like you know what i mean they're starting to believe me i'm like you live in you know whatever new jersey for instance or wherever mm -hmm. you want to live and you know, instead of spending all the rent here, come mm -hmm. once a month and like mm -hmm. make it concentrated and then go back and have your fabulous larger studio and mm -hmm. you can make works that you really want to do and you won't have to, you know, work all day long just to survive here. Because this place, the New York especially, which is where I live, is mm -hmm. is is just beyond, it's it's financially, you know, until the city decides to make affordable housing, housing. and workspace yeah yeah housing mm -hmm. and workspace a yeah. thing which it's it's doing but it needs to continue then you know stay away it, it can't have yeah it's difficult it's just it's just more of a challenge than you yeah. know look at beautiful artists like henry taylor who's been at it for generations and you know he didn't he didn't live in new york he lives mm -hmm. in la and he doesn't live in like that central you know what i mean he's he's cultivated his craft over time and, yes. and and not not to follow a trend but to because he loves to make the work that he does yes well thank you uh Zaviera, for taking the time to speak to us today and uh i wish you all the best hopefully i'll see you soon thank you so much and congratulations on all that you have going on Thanks. Yeah, it's all good. I think 2020 is the year uh, we'll all remember as a uh, sun starting to rise in everyone's life. Yes, yes, yes. We hope in uh, more ways than we can even one. say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll I'll say bye now. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Join us next week uh, for an interview with artist Hannes Bend. Uh, Hannes is a very special artist. He's doing work really close to my heart. Uh, artists like him uh, basically transforming the world one person at a time from the inside out. Uh, join us then to learn more about his wonderful practice. <laughs>